During Advent, we talk a lot about hope. That's what the season is about, right? Hope. Our hope for the return of Christ. Hope for the future of our species and our planet. Hope for the return of light and of forgiveness of sin and the end of death. Hope for the healing of the nations and of the world. We remind ourselves that just as we know Christmas is coming at the end of the month, we, the days are surely coming when Jesus will return and establish God's reign of justice and peace over all the earth. But what are we to do when that thing for which we are hoping seems so far off? This is the question with which Malachi and his fellow prophets grapple. According to the theology that frames their lives, God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. But these people have lived through exile and return. Their lived reality suggests that God either doesn't care or can't help. Not only do the godless rule over the godly, but immoral actions seem to have no consequences. Liars and cheats and scoundrels prosper while nice guys finish last. It's enough to make people wonder, is there any reason to obey the commandments and act justly when it doesn't really seem to matter one way or the other? Malachi assures his readers that the messenger of the Lord is coming, that when he comes, things are going to change, that the priests and perhaps also the people of Jerusalem and Judea will be purified from injustice and corruption like silver is refined from ore. Then, he says, then they will be able to make offerings pleasing to the Lord, just like in the good old days. But when will that be? In Luke's gospel story, the evangelist presents John the Baptist as the fulfillment of this hope. Amidst the backdrop of major players like Herod and Philip and Pilate and Licinius appears this nobody. This crazy guy with bugs in his beard. This voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the one for whom we hope. But we know the story. We know John was beheaded. And we know that Jesus, the one for whom he was preparing the way, was crucified. So much for hope. Now don't get me wrong, I think hope is really important. It's a good thing. It's a it's with good reason that we focus ourselves and hone our hope during this Advent season, especially in days when hope can seem in such short supply. Hope can keep us from despair, give us reason to go on. But today, as I read these lessons, I reflect on the fact that hope has its limits. As we sit in the darkness of Advent, we are faced with the reality that sometimes hope never comes to fruition. At least, not for us. ta Coates observes, Slavery in this country was 250 years. What that means is that there were African Americans who were born in this country in 1750, 1760, and if they looked backwards, their parents were slaves, their grandparents were slaves, their great-grandparents were slaves. And if they looked forward, their children would be slaves, their grandchildren would be slaves, and very possibly their great-grandchildren will be slaves. There was no real hope within their individual lifespan of ending enslavement, the most brutal form of degradation in this country's history. There was nothing in their life that said, this will end in my lifetime. I will see the end of this." End quote. As we stare into the dark of Advent, we are confronted with the fact that sometimes there is no hope, no matter how badly we want there to be. Sometimes there is simply sin and death and evil, because that's life. The dark is as real and as present as the light. Hope can give us strength to face the dark, but hope can also become a drug that we use to ignore the dark. Austin Channing Brown recalls how after Coates published Between the World and Me, his memoir of black life in America, the media, both secular and religious, sought endlessly for some kernel of hope within his book. She writes, 
People read his words about America, about its history, its present, about the realities of living in a black body, and then demanded hopefulness. It boggles the mind, she says. As I consider our Advent scripture readings today and the words of Ta-Nehisi Coates and Austin Channing Brown, I begin to wonder if sometimes hope becomes used as a tool for privilege. Whiteness can demand hope and can uh, enforce its fulfillment. People like Herod and Philip and Pilate and Lysanias, they can create hope with the machinery of empire, bringing about law and order, uh, promising safety and health and stability. But that hope always comes with a cost. People like Brown and Coates cannot hope, not in the same way. People like John and Jesus, like the Judeans of their time and of Malachi's time, like the African Americans born in the middle of the 18th century, they cannot hope, not like Pilate and Herod can. They can never see their hopes fulfilled, no matter how hard they try. And yet somehow this does not mean they despair. Coates goes on to observe that in spite of having no hope whatsoever of seeing the end of slavery in any meaningful period of time, these folks still struggled for freedom. They still resisted the degradation of their bodies and the abuse of their humanity. How can that be possible without hope? Without hope, isn't despair all that's left? Maybe not. Brown writes in her own memoir about the death of hope. I will quote her here at length because she says what I can't. Uh, she writes, I have learned not to fear the death of hope. I don't really want to recount all the ways that hope has let me down. It's all so damn painful. But all this comes with living, with struggling, with believing in the possibility of change. The death of hope gives way to a sadness that heals, to anger that inspires, to wisdom that empowers me the next time I get up to work, to pick up my pen, to join a march, to tell my story. Each death of hope has been painful and costly, but in the morning, there is always rises a new clarity about the world, about the church, about myself, about God. I cannot hope in whiteness. I cannot hope in white people or white institutions or white America. I cannot hope in lawmakers or politicians, and I cannot even hope in pastors or ministries or mission statements. I cannot hope in misquoted wisdom from MLK, superficial ethnic heritage celebrations, or love that is aloof. I cannot even hope in myself. I am no one's savior. The longer this gets, the longer this list gets, the more elusive hope becomes. I do not believe that I or my children or my grandchildren will live in an America that has achieved racial equality. And so I stand in the legacy of all that black Americans have already accomplished in their resistance, in their teachings, in their voices, in their faith. And I work toward a world unseen, currently unimaginable. I look at the present, at police brutality, racial disparities, backlash against being politically incorrect, hatred for our first black president, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, the election of a chief executive who stoked the fire of racial animosity to win. And I ask myself, where is your hope, Austin? The answer? It is but a shadow. In this cool place, I see the sun setting behind me, its light as far away as the stars, and I let the limitations of hope settle over me. I possess not the strength of hope, but its weakness, its fragility, its ability to die, because I must demand anyway. It is my birthright. It is the culmination of everything my ancestors endured, of all that my parents taught me, 
of the, of the blackness that rescued me. How dare I consider surrendly, surrender simply because I want the warmth of the sun. This warmth has not been promised me. My faith does not require it." End quote. Wow. What I hear Brown saying in these words is that as a black woman in America, she cannot pretend the darkness does not exist. That luxury is not available to her. She cannot dismiss it or ignore it like white folks can. She has been left with no choice but to stare into the darkness. But it is that very darkness, the shadow of hope, the death of hope, that enables her to do what she knows she must. It's not the hopes that she may one day enjoy the fruit of that labor, but the belief that the work itself is important and good because the work itself is righteous. And this reminds me of something. It reminds me that Advent is not just about hope. It's about preparation. Malachi speaks of the messenger who will come to prepare the descendants of Levi, a process that he implies will be arduous and unpleasant, much like being subjected to the heat of a refining fire or the caustic soap of a fuller but a process which is also righteous, which is good and important in its own right. Paul encourages the Philippians by reminding them that, about the good work done among them by God and that that work will produce the harvest of righteousness. He reminds them that they are being prepared for something. They do not present this preparation as something that we can do for ourselves or to ourselves, but instead imagine something that is done to us, something that comes from outside of us. And so I wonder if, beside the light of hope, the darkness itself can also sometimes prepare us for God's reign. That's what I'm hearing in Brown's words. I hear her saying that the death of hope has kept her from simply waiting for God's reign and has actually pushed her into God's reign. We speak of the reign of God as something which is both already and not yet. And while white folks can hope for the not yet from the comfort and safety of privilege, the darkness of racism and oppression have, has swept Brown up into the already of it. That's the legacy of black Americans, she says. To live the reality of justice and equality, even though that reality does not yet exist. And so I wonder today, I wonder if by focusing too much on hope, by straining our eyes to look beyond or through the darkness rather than at it, if by demanding hope when there is none to be found, if we sometimes use hope as a way to try to escape the fire of the refiner, the fire that will refine us of our impurities like apathy and complacency. When we demand satisfaction, excuse me, when we demand that our dissatisfaction and our discomfort be taken away, are we closing ourselves off to what God is doing in the dark? This Advent season, I wonder if the death of our hope for Jesus' return might be another way in which God might be preparing us for his coming. <laughs>